Hey folks, I hope you're having a fantastic day. I've got a great podcast today for you. At least I think it's fantastic. But before we get into that, let me remind you, if you're a pet owner, please be responsible and have your pets spayed or neutered. All right, so let's get into it right now. So my guest today is Daisy Khan. She is an activist. She is the author of 30 Rights of Muslim women. Now we're going to talk about that, but we're also going to talk a little bit more about Islam and the Muslim culture and some of the myths behind it. So we're going to try to dispel some of these things. And I, for one, I'm one that's guilty of, you know, thinking that this was true. Let me read some of these myths for you that I found. So one of them is actually that women don't have rights, but according to uh, the Quran, it says The Quran states that men and women are equal in the eyes of Allah and that women have the right to refuse a prospective husband. I didn't know that. I thought if I thought they had to. It it goes on to say that they can inherit property. uh, They could conduct business and they have access to knowledge, all of which I thought were, you know, banned, if you want to put it that way, against women or that women could not do any of these things they did not have the right to make their choices on this something else here where it says that women are forced to wear the hijab i'm not for sure if i'm pronouncing that correctly hijab hajib i think it's hijab but you know that's part of the clothing the garb but it says that they don't have to but many of them choose to but it also a lot of this really depends on which country that you are in that can make a difference because as we all know that when it comes to faith when it comes to religion there are groups that interpret or do things their way. So I hope I'm not putting that out wrong. But anyhow, there's a lot of different things that we're going to talk about. So please, I hope you enjoy this, like I said, enlightening, fantastic podcast today with guest Daisy Khan, the author of 30 Rights of Muslim Women. Please remember to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. It really helps us out. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I wrote this book because in some ways I've actually been writing this book in my head (laughs) for a long time since 9-11 because after 9-11 we immediately went to Afghanistan to you know to wage a war against against Taliban and to wage a war against Osama bin Laden but we also got to see the terrible images that of Taliban mistreating women and whipping women on the streets and preventing women from living in the fullness of their being. And those images were always brought to America through our silver screens. At that time, we only had television. We didn't have too much other stuff. And that shaped this perception that somehow all Muslim women are oppressed and suppressed because those are the only images that Americans were seeing. And um, as I began doing my public speaking, I was speaking to audiences and they were asking me all these questions about women. Why are women stoned? Why are women, you know, why is there a child marriage? Um, Why are women denied all their basic rights? Why are women second class citizens? And I, as a Muslim woman who was, you know, fairly educated, I was sent abroad to America to pursue an education. And I came from a fairly, you know, devout Muslim home. So I just knew that reality didn't match what they were seeing. So I was always speaking about this issue and explaining to the public, but of course the audience is very small. You know, you may have a couple of people in the room and to go from one to the other took some time. So, and uh, all these questions that were asked of me and then the questions that I was actually trying to address, the real concerns of women that I was trying to address overseas because I was seeing things that were unacceptable to me as a Muslim woman. So I thought it's time for me to actually put it in a book that is accessible to the general public. Okay. And so I wrote it for people like you who might be wanting to know what is the truth or for that woman in the church who is struggling to understand this or all my fellow Americans if they want to know from an authentic source what is the truth and what is the reality. So yeah, that was the know, reason behind this. <laughs> a very good reason. And I, I'm going to say, you mentioned that with 9-11, and that's when we became more aware of what we would say are the falsehoods or the falseness of um, the treatment of women's or women's rights 
in Muslim yeah. countries. But I recall even before 9-11, that was my perception. Um, and I'll even give a, a, a short little example of, I. this is my Western culture thinking, of course, we're going to say this, I'm going to be one of those guys, one of those Western guys. So I, and everybody says, I have a friend, I have a friend. Yeah. And he, uh, he's Muslim. He mm -hmm. married his, uh, a Muslim gal, but when they were here, I had noticed that every time that I was around, she was never, or when the guys were all around, she was never around, never in our presence, unless called for to, I need a glass of water or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I don't know if that just carried on this silver screen, uh, I was like, Western culture propaganda of yeah. how things were for uh, Muslim women. Um, what am I getting at? I guess I want to say, do we have the media to blame a lot of this on? So the media shapes perception. And mm -hmm. as you know, now we have an opportunity, Chuck, to speak to somebody like you, right? So you are now communicating with a real Muslim who can tell you the reality of Muslims, right? Firsthand. Yes. But media never brought people, I mean, I have been on a fair amount of media, but I was like a singular voice. There needed to be more voices. So every time you see a negative perception, you have to have at least a positive positive image of something for you to counter, you know, counteract that negative image. And the problem is that we've had so many negative images associated with Islam, whether it's terrorism, linking Islam to terrorism and the acts of terrorists, and then the subjugation of women at the hands of Taliban, then people think all 2 billion Muslims, and by the way, there are 2 billion Muslims in the world, 2 billion, <laughs> which a lot. is like one, one fifth of humanity is a Muslim person. <laughs> so it's, that's not the reality everywhere. So Muslims come from very diverse cultures. So you just mentioned the story about you know, the boys hanging out together and the woman is only coming in. That's a cultural thing. It's a, it's a layover from the home country where men and women do not mix socially, especially in a home environment when your, 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 your gal pals are coming over and your bunch of guys hanging out. Women just don't enter into that. But that's not the case with every Muslim that I know. Many Muslims, there's, you know, gender mixing here in America. So they adapt to American culture very easily. And so this may have been uh, a particular person who decided not to adapt to that. So, uh, you know, and you go to Muslim countries and there's no gender segregation. And there are some countries where there's real gender segregation. So it's very cultural. So gender segregation is cultural based. You know, I'm glad you're saying that about it's very um, cultural culturally based and there's even within the culture a lot of us may act react or do things slightly different yeah. and i think you made me just now realize that it's a cultural thing but i filled in the gap and made yeah. up a story behind exactly. that culture that i did not understand exactly exactly yeah because you don't have a, a, a nuanced understanding so mm -hmm. when you don't have a nuanced understanding of where do these traditions come from and where did something stem and what is the reason for it, then you fill in the gaps you, you, because, because the negative perceptions are being created by the press that women are subjugated. So you think, oh, it must be the subjugation that she's being hidden and she's being silenced right. or she's being sidelined because that's another perception that women have no voice. Women, you know, are not supposed to be seen. So that... And, you know, today with Afghanistan preventing women from going anywhere, if, if you hear the horror stories there, you would think, oh, my God, this must be real. But again, they're weaponizing the religion. They are misogynistic men who are weaponizing religion against women. And so we have to peel that onion, layers of onion. And that's why I wrote this book, because I wanted to write this book to show people clearly what is the religion and what is the custom or the culture that is trumping the religion. I um, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say this. It, it, it's very similar to uh, the Catholic priesthood. And we've heard a lot of things that have been happening there with um, child molestation and things like that. It happens. It's not that we're saying it happens everywhere or that it does not happen absolutely. So same thing with uh, within the um, Islam and Muslim uh, culture, there can be groups of men or groups 
that behave in, in, in this stereotypical way that we view all mm -hmm. or many Muslims to be, which yeah. is not the correct way to, to, to view things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Imagine if you were to assume that all Catholics were potential child molesters, because that's what they did with Islam. They said, okay, uh, Islam and terrorism is linked, and this has to do with Islamophobia, the rise of Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. So because terrorist attacks were done by Muslims, so therefore it must be Islam that is behind this. And if it's Islam, then every Muslim is a national security threat. And so therefore there must be different, there must be profiling of Muslims. So then Muslims were profiled on planes and Muslims were profiled in places where there were security concerns. So, so you have this, um, you know, a group, you, we are blaming an entire group for the actions of a few. And we've done that before in history, by the way. Oh, yes. <laughs> we locked up the Japanese. <laughs> we locked up the Japanese because we didn't like one group of Japanese doing something. So we, we are good at this. We repeat the same mistake again and again. But the truth is that there are 3.5 million Muslims, anywhere from 3.5 to 6 million, and like 1% of the population. And all of us are law abiding. As far as I know, the Muslims that I know is everybody's law abiding. <laughs> they're they are like yeah. model students in, in school. There's, you never have to worry about gun violence at the hands of Muslims. So so yeah, the reality is very different. I just wish people knew that. And like I said, you, you have your book. So uh, what are some of these um, myths, these rights that we think that all Muslim women do not have? Yeah, well, so the first thing is that we do not think that Muslim women are, like you said earlier, they're not public, so therefore they're not in leadership roles. And, you know, if they're not public, they're not out there, they can't be in a leadership role. But did you know that 15 Muslim women have been heads of state? More than any other religious group. I'm talking about major countries, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Turkey, you know, Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country in the, in the world. Mm. So, and we've had 15 and it's growing. And we have women who are ambassadors and we have women who are in parliaments. So women are very active. And in the United States, 22 women have run for local elections and 20 of them have won. And they are ranging from ages 24 to 60. So yes, Muslim women are very active. And so the reality just does not match, um, you know, uh, what, what, what the religion teaches. So if you take a look at our scriptures, and I don't know if you are into scripture, but if you take a look at our scriptures, if you look at the, the Christian uh, scripture and you look at the Muslim scripture, both describe Queen of Sheba as being a wise, astute leader because who understood that Solomon had greater powers. And so, uh, and the Quran actually mentions that she is an archetype of a wise political leader because she didn't want to go to war. She didn't want conflict. So she was willing to negotiate. She was willing to use her female intuition to negotiate and avoid war. Mm. And that is the reality there. And today we're talking about Kamala Harris, right? right. And we're naming her Jezebel. <laughs> and then we're giving her all these other crazy miserable catwoman things as if she doesn't belong in that leadership role, right? So why has America not produced 15 heads of state? Look, why, do, why haven't we had a female president? And we are the vanguards of democracy, aren't we not? Don't we talk about women's rights all the time? Mm -hmm. So something doesn't match here either. So what I'm saying is that what is happening overseas and what doesn't match, the reality doesn't match, the, I mean, the, the, uh, what's happening on the ground doesn't match what the scriptures shows. Similarly, our constitution also talks about all people are equal, right? So why are we having such a hard time just electing a woman? Like, why has it always become such an issue? Because there's something underlying it. You know, there's yes. like a, so, so that underlying it has to do with human beings, not the scriptures themselves. That's a very good way of putting it. And I mean, yes, even though at the very beginning I said I'm going to be one of those Western culture guys, a stereotypical person who believes in everything that I see on the silver screen about uh, Islam and uh, Islamophobia and Muslim and Muslim women, I, I don't 
want to put myself in that category because I, I do believe in the, the rights. And but I guess it really takes somebody like yourself and this grassroots movement, if we can call it that, to let Western and hopefully it's OK that I keep saying Western culture, Western mm -hmm. culture world understand that this is not everyone and everything. This is not how um, the Islam faith is. This is not how Muslims are in general. Yeah. 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 This is exactly the myth that we have to bust. Isn't that's why I wrote this book and I called it 30 Rights of Muslim Women because I'm busting every myth that has been out there. So people say that, oh, they honor kill their, their women. Yeah, honor killings have been happening in Spain. Honor killings have been happening in South America. And so, I mean, they're Catholic. So why don't you ever blame Catholicism for, for, for honor killings? Yes, honor killings do happen in some instances, but it's a, a crime of passion. And, but it is not permitted by Islam because, because you can't just kill anybody without due process. That's what the scripture says. You have no right to take, you know, uh, the law into your own hands. Everything has a due process. So to kill in the name of honor is, you know, is, is going against uh, is going against the edicts of our scripture. So, so that's another one. You know, they say child marriage. Yes, child marriages do happen in some countries because of poverty. People want to sell their daughters because they can't feed them. There are all mm -hmm. kinds of social reasons for it. It's not like you want to give your daughter away just because you feel like it. But again, it's tied to, again, what does the, what does Islam say about that? What does the Quran say about that? The Quran talks about uh, husband and wife or spouses contracting into marriage with one another. In other words, it's a physical contract. So how can you read a contract when you are just a child? How do you know what you're consenting to, right? So right. it's logical. So you have to have some level of maturity. You have to have spiritual maturity. You have to have emotional maturity and physical maturity for you to enter marriage. So whether it's 16 or 18, that's a different, you know, different cultures have different ages. But the point is this perception that somehow child marriage is a Muslim thing when in America, in certain states in America, we don't even have laws against child marriage. And, and, and women do get married as children here in America you know, in certain yeah. parts of the country. And I don't want to say which states, but yeah. there are parts of the country which don't have any, you know, uh, age limit for, for marriage, for when people can enter mar into marriage. So what I'm saying is that these things exist in all cultures, but to blame Islam for everything is where the problem is. And it all stems from Islamophobia, the fear of Islam, which got instilled into the minds of people after 9-11. And can prior to 9-11, even. Yeah. Can you tell us really, um, this may sound silly, but what is Islam? Yeah, Islam itself means um, submitting to the will of God or submitting peacefully to the will of God. So that's what it means. And uh, it's peace, it's like a, a deriving peace from following God or being connected to God. So it's that simple. You're God centric. And then a Muslim is literally somebody who then submits to the will of God, you know, and uh, and that that's that's the definition. And the Muslim name itself has a capital M and a small M and a small M are Muslims who follow the Prophet Muhammad, who is our prophet. Mm -hmm. And the capital M are Muslims, which the Quran describes as anybody who 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 uh, recognizes that there's only one God. So anybody who believes in one God is technically a Muslim. Okay. Um, so belief in God is key in Islam. You know, we're going to get a lot of people saying, that's not true. That's not my God. Well, but there's only one God. Okay, so right. you can define God in, in many different ways. God has been defined by many different names and diff many different ways. But there's only one creator. So whether right. we, what, what name we call that creator by, if somebody can prove to me there's another creator, I'm happy to hear that, that argument. <laughs> See, and I'm glad you're saying this, and this is why I ask, because many people in the Western culture will say, no, there's only one God, my God. Yeah. They differentiate gods from other cultures and stuff rather than, like yeah. I said, as one God. I may call my God this you call yeah, your God that, yeah, but it's the same. You can call same. him Bhagwan, you can call him Allah, you can call him Yahweh. God has been called by so many different names from so many different cultures, but it's the creator. 
It's like mm-hmm. the Buddhists don't even Buddhists don't even give a name to God because they say that God is so great that you can't even name God. You know, so it's like, how can you even name something that is so great and so, you know, the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything that that God created? And and yeah, we're, we're human beings, but human beings have this tendency to split into different groups and assert their superiority. So that that's a that's a problem. <laughs> Yes, and um, and I know this. And I I know that you know this, but you you definitely have an uphill battle. Oh yeah, you know, it, it's gonna worse. <laughs> it, yes, um, it's only going to get worse, and it possibly could even be much worse. <laughs> you I know what know I'm talking much, about? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't think we can bear it anymore because we're going through so many things at so many different levels. But you know. I'll tell you something, what doesn't kill you makes you very strong. So the Muslim community has been a, a community that has been under duress since 9-11. It's a community that is deep in deep duress, meaning it's a community that constantly gets pressed upon from all points of, if, if you just look at Islamophobia, we've had to deal with Islamophobia since 9-11, meaning people fear us for all kinds of irrational reasons. <laughs> There's no rational reason to fear Muslims because, like I said, we're good neighbors, we're your local doctor, we're your street vendor, you know, we, 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 we've gone to the, we've gone to the, we've gone to, into space, we, we're making a sizable contribution and we are all over sports and in entertainment. So, so we are a community that is contributing to America's, you know, uh, success, but, but we are seen through this, through this prism of national security and through this prism that was created uh, after 9-11 and continues to do so. So, um, but we've become a very resilient community as a result of that. Like you know, we just know how to bounce right back. So we know what to expect. We are bracing for the elections because we become a wedge issue during elections. So you'll see a lot of things being whipped up about Muslims and Islam. Like there'll be mm-hmm. a, there'll be like a remark about Muslims <laughs> that you'll hear. I mean, one of the presidential candidates is calling another presidential candidate a Palestinian <laughs> because because that's like a slur now. There's nothing else that you can say. So, <laughs> so <laughs> we see these things. We cringe when we hear them, but then it just we just bounce right back because we know we have to survive. We yeah. don't have another home to go to. Survive. Well, I was just going to say survival of the fittest, but. Um, I, it, that, that's the wrong way of putting that. Um, you know, and I was just thinking too, with, uh, you keep bringing it up nine 11 and the fact is that it, that was nine 11 was quite some time ago, really. And yeah. the, the yeah. people who are now I might get crap for this, but I'm going to say that the people who are really making a, a huge, just think about all this with, uh, Muslims or, uh, Islam, they grew up during that 9-11 time, and they are now at that age. And um, although I said, you know, before 9-11, because I'm old enough to know things before, and that mm-hmm. was still my perception, but it was not this as an as evil of a perception as it is now. Yeah. Uh, yeah if, it's that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it's gotten much worse. It actually was post 9-11, we had, a pre- we had a president who came out and said, Islam is a peaceful religion, Muslims are not to blame for it. And that was a very, yeah, we had some hate crimes here and there, but generally speaking, the, the, uh, the uh, you know, the leader at the highest level uh, set the right tone. And yeah. although the press uh, continued to show negative images and those negative images got shaped, but the politicians were saying the right things. But now we have the press plus the politicians in tune yeah. with one another, saying these uh, things that are untrue, false most of the time, and creating shaping a narrative that then creates policy that is not uh, informed, uh, you know, policy that then gets shaped uh, because people were misinformed about yeah. about it particular faith or people. So this has this has huge consequences for the Muslim community. And like I said, if you just get to know a local Muslim, uh, a, a, you know, get to know a Muslim, uh, you will be able to see them from a completely different lens, you know, yes. 
because you will have a nuanced understanding of who they are, what they like, the foods that they eat, how family oriented they are. We're very family oriented people. I mean, you know, we come here, um, we ha half, half the Muslims in this country are immigrants and half of them are indigenous, the African American community. So both of our communities are very family oriented, uh, hard working, entrepreneurially and, you know, entrepreneur minded kind of people. Yeah. And uh, so, so we are contributing. It's just going to take us a little time to define ourselves. Well, yes, definitely. And it's so hard to, to, you need media, but it's hard. You need media to beat media. Uh, yeah, exactly. and, and it's yeah. <laughs> because, you know, we, we were put into our brains so much that we heard Osama bin Laden. We heard the Taliban, now Hezbollah, and mm -hmm. all these negative things associated with, again, the small group of people. But then we look at it as all the of them, every. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I know we're mainly supposed to be focusing on women, but this, I think, really does uh, shed some light on our thinking, Western culture thinking, because we're looking at uh, Muslims as almost all the same uh, men monolith. and women. Uh, yeah, monolith. Yes. Monolith. I mean, how can you look at anybody as a monolith? I, I imagine uh, people looking at America, 300 and some plus million people as a monolith. And are we a monolith? We can't even agree, you know, <laughs> with, with our next door neighbor on something. <laughs> I yeah. mean, the kind, of, the kind of diversity we have in America in terms of our views and the opinions and the sharp divides that we have, those are the same divisions that exist even within Muslim communities, countries, and societies. So it's very immature to think that a group is monolith when, in yeah. fact, there's as much complexity and as much diversity. Um, like Chris Christianity is as diverse as Islam is. And Christianity spans as many cultures as Islam does. In, in fact, Islam even spans even more because we span both the East and the West. So, um, so to think that all of Catholicism is the same or all of Protestants are the same, it's, very, it's a very spiritually immature way of looking at it. So I think you know, we need to like wisen up a little bit. <laughs> To, yes. to who people are and, and, to, and to make these distinctions between um, the people that are destructive and have a political agenda, which, by the way, in a lot of cultures, there are small groups of people that have political agendas, and then they, you know, use, um, use uh, violence to achieve that. Uh, so I give an example of, you know, most people think that Buddhists are very... Uh, very much, uh, you know, peace loving people and, and majority of them are. But in Myanmar, we saw Buddhist monks in cahoots with politicians, basically pushing out a million people, million Muslims and using violence, like real, like that was shocking to me. But you can see that how people can resort to violence if there is a political agenda. And then there are, yes. there are religious people behind that politi politi political agenda because that mobilizes large groups of people. You know, religion is one of the biggest motiv motivating force for, for people. So, so people are very smart. They figured out, oh, if we could just use religion, we can whip up the fervor and we can get a lot of people galvanized. So it's, it's a strategy that people are using. So yeah, so why don't we not make that same distinction with Muslims? Because Muslims are also have there are groups within our community that have a political agenda then that whip up the sentiment and weaponize religion, just like everybody else is doing it. So, Yeah, it's, uh, you use the word weaponize religion, and I, I look at it as religion. Re it's, to me, it's fear. Uh, you said a lot of people know what they're doing, but also even more people don't know. And then if you put fear into them, they're going to follow who they, who they believe I think, yeah. and they believe in their fear. And then that's those, we'll just say the smart people who use that to their advantage. Yeah. But it's not very smart of them that they want the world to be a better place. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, fear is, 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 is very debilitating. And if you tell somebody that you have to fear your neighbor because your neighbor is about to take something over from you, then that, that people act on that fear because they really think that, oh, my God, somebody's about to take over. So, so there is this irrational fear that has been created about Islam. 
for instance, like I said, we're 1% of the population. <laughs> and so there are certain Christian nationalists that have this fear that most, the Muslims are going to take over this country. And that's what they say. Islam is here to take over. Muslims are here to take over. A 1% is going to take over 99%? Like, statistically, that's just not possible. Right. You know? So, and this is the great replacement theory, and that somehow Muslims are going to, you know, uh, push out the white people. And But again, somebody is just whipping up this fear. It's irrational. It makes no sense. There's no statistically. It cannot be backed up. And, but yet people act on that fear because they're told that, the, that their survival is at stake. It comes down to the fear of the unknown. I think, uh, you know, the, the human behavior of that, uh, fight or flight, all of that. Yeah. If, if you don't have, and if you don't give a chance to uh, someone who's Muslim, and I think a lot of people even add color to Muslim, and they mm -hmm. look at a color yeah. of the skin and yeah. make determinations that way. Yeah. But I think if you give somebody the opportunity and truly just listen, mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. going to find out that, like you said, a lot of these things cross-culturally are no different than what we are here. There's yeah. all, there, there's, there are more similarities than there are differences, I think, uh, yeah. between people. Yeah. Yeah. And you talked about, <clears throat> you know, people see Muslims in a certain way, and that's why this uh, Islamophobia can actually affect not only Muslims, but also non-Muslims who may be mistaken to be a Muslim. Mm -hmm. so, so sometimes a poor Indian will get shot or a Sikh person will get, you know, pulled over or killed because they are mistaken to be a Muslim. Because again, the perception that all Muslims are Middle Eastern or Arab or brown looking is a perception that was shaped by the press. So if you look at the landscape of the Muslim community, you have the people all the way from the Caucasus. They're about as white as you can get, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then you have the Turks and then you have. So you have the whole white kind of Caucasian race that exists all over Central Asia. And then you have everything from, you know, the uh, Southeast Asian. Then you have 20 million Chinese Muslims. People did not, do not know this. There are 20 million Chinese Muslims. So Muslims are also Chinese. <laughs> I mean, they're the Uyghurs, but they're, they're, they, and then they are all the way from Southeast Asia. They're in the Philippines. You have Malaysians, you have Indonesians, then you have the whole Indian subcontinent, which is South Asia. And then you have European Muslims, then you have Middle Eastern Muslims, and you have Europeans like Bosnians and other people. So you have the whole gamut. And then you have Africans because you have real, you know, big nations in Africa like Nigeria, Sudan. So it's about as diverse as Christianity is. Uh, and, right. Both come in all shades of color, all okay. the way. All the way. So there is no browning. There's like, you know, we, I mean, the Quran has a verse that says we created into nations and tribes so you may get to know one another. So it's actually a divine plan to create us different and interesting so that we may be curious about the others. I, I want to get to know you. That's why people travel. That's why people love to go and see other places. Let me see who they live, how they live, you know, and it, it yeah. enriches this universe. Imagine if we were all the same, like there would be no reason for us to go traveling or, you know, getting to know one another. I'm glad you said that because I was just going to bring that up. There are a lot of people say, oh, I want to live in a perfect world, a perfect this. Well, what what fun is in that? If everything okay. was perfect, then there would be no motivation to do anything, no go, go anywhere to see, nor to right. learn because right. everything is perfect. To me, or this to is... Fix. Or to it, fix. If every problem was already solved, what were you going to fix in this life? Right. If you don't have a problem to fix, what would we do? <laughs> They, they they talk about oh ascension and we're we're above that now no that's called a, a, a decline I think it's just like we all become dummies <laughs> yeah and you know you hear stories about <clears throat> people who are trust fund babies they have all the wealth in the world and oftentimes they wind up being the most miserable people because there is yeah. nothing to want anymore there is no desire to accumulate there is nothing to fight for <laughs> so so. Oh. So yeah, there is nothing like struggle because it makes you stronger. It it creates character. It builds, 
you know, you get to see your own abilities. Like the work I do, Chuck, it's, it's, I, it was all thrust upon me. I, I didn't want this. I was an architectural designer. I, w I had a profession for 25 years. Right. And I had to quit all that because my community needed me. I had no, and I was trying to solve the biggest problems in the world. Me, one person by myself. But I realized that struggle has made me, has expanded me so much as a human being. Like I've done so much because it needs to be done. Yes. And because I stepped up. And because every challenge that I get, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try and fix that. I'm going to try and fix that. So when people say, oh, I just want everything to be beautiful, I'm like, you know, then that's not the journey. The journey is full of pitfalls. <laughs> the journey has things in it, right? Like, like yeah. you have to, like you, you, you might have, you might go in a fall in a creek, or you might be pushed here. I mean, life is a journey, and life is nothing but a journey. And it's the journey that you're on <laughs> that you have to figure out. Yes, and you know, I I love your passion about this, and this is part of the thing that we were just talking about. As far as you know, in this perfect place, there would be nothing to do. There would be no passion. You have passion. You have drive. You have commitment. It makes you. Um, this is the only word I could think of or any phrase. It, it makes you a better person, and I think that's what we all. Better, it okay. also makes us a better country. Y yes, I was going right? to add on there that. Right. If every person strives to be better, then your entire community becomes better. Yeah. Uh, it, so. Yeah. And, and so you can look at it from a social point of view, or you can also look at it from an entrepreneurial point of view. So that's why, because I'm a bit of an entrepreneur myself. So socially, yes, to be able to solve social problems and fix the, the issues that plague human beings at the personal level, and spiritual level is so important and that's why people like us uh, are born and we have to do that and we have to step into it. but then there is this whole different entrepreneurial side where people are seeking to solve a societal problem or to innovate something new i mean aren't we masters at innovation what drives that innovation that desire to find that next fix that next thing, create that, whatever that is, AI or social media, the crazy stuff we've created, some of it, you know, creating mayhem, but a lot of it, you know, is good. Yeah. Where, where is that coming from? It's coming from that desire, that personal commitment to want, to seek, to know. It's that curiosity. So I don't know what happened with, with that side of us. And then all of a sudden it became completely, you know, shut down. Like, oh no, we're perfect. We are the way we are. We need to stay the way we are, and we need to go into our silo. How did that happen? This is not America. No, it's, it's become it's not the American ethos. It, it, it's we've become very complacent and good enough. It's a society of good enough. Yeah, um, and, and and hearkening back to the greatness, not trying to go for greatness in the future, right? Yeah. We have no idea what we're capable of. We still don't know, you know. We have a lot of things that we have to fix as a nation because we're still kind of in, in our, you know, we're using the same strategies that we use like the last 50, 60 years. We have to think a little differently, think outside the box. The world mm -hmm. is changing, right? And right. we have to keep up with our innovative spirit to be able to lead the world again. Otherwise, yes, we we're going to fall back. We're going to fall yeah. back. And I, I don't want to fall back, but I also <laughs> want to make sure that people know Dr. Daisy Khan where they could find you your book and then let's uh, let's let's uh let's resolve okay, another this, myth yeah so this is my book 30 rights of muslim woman it's on amazon and in all the bookstores so if people can buy it it's on sale right now they've dropped the price it's 22 okay. but also they can get it from the library if they can't afford to buy it so please get oh. it from the library if you can't afford to buy the book and you just want to loan it out the library will get it for you and then, of course, my web, my website is daisycon.com, D-A-I-S-Y-K-H-A-N.com. And people can send me a message from that. It's info at daisycon, and I will receive the message personally, and I always respond to people. So if anybody wants to reach out to me to connect and to stay tuned, happy to do that. You know, I want to add this, too, is... If, if you're somebody that's watching or listening to this and you say, well, I have no Muslims around me, well, how am I going to do this? Ah, they're all the same. Well, here you have somebody who is of 
who is Muslim, who wrote the book. And this is a this is some place to start too. You're yeah. getting it firsthand from an actual person rather than somebody like me writing about it. You know, yeah. I, I pick up my information and I put it on the page and I sell it. Right. Th th this exactly. is not how this is. This is right. you're getting it from the from the right person. So yeah. if 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 you have that fear of going out and meeting somebody, if you say that there are no Muslims around me in my community, but I am curious now. Yeah. Go to the library or go to Amazon and pick up the book. Yeah. Yeah. And if somebody is really wanting to befriend a Muslim and I know what state they're in, I can connect you with people in that state. And let's get this like in the old days. Remember the pen pal system? We used to mm -hmm. have a pen pal. You could write a letter to somebody and make them a pal. Well, let's make the pen pal system. <laughs> we create that... the 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 system between a muslim and a non-muslim like come together and get to know one another you'll be really surprised and you i guarantee you're going to have some great food if not anything else well i was going to say you know <laughs> you're going to have to do a dinner party uh, via zoom but yeah, I and, and, and share party. share recipes and things yeah. like that your cultural recipes and eat and talk on a zoom yeah. platform yeah yeah i mean i remember many years ago until shogun came along you know, Japanese food, uh, completely unknown. And then all of a sudden we saw this series called Shogun. And then <laughs> yeah. you knew it, everybody was wanting to have sushi. And now sushi is like an American food, right? Right. I mean, similarly, so much food has been introduced by Muslims in this country already that you're not even aware of. You know, the hummus, the biryani, the... All, all these like staple foods that people are now eating falafel that they that oh this, right this is our contribution we are coming to america and contributing and people are enjoying it and it's and, not just our cuisine because we span so many cultures so everybody brings their own cuisine and it enriches the american cuisine landscape and you know and, that's the one thing that that we all love about america is that now you have quinoa. Okay, we did not know what quinoa was. Now we're <laughs> you know, this seed and that seed. But it, we get enriched by this continued immigration because immigrants always bring authentic food to this country because they have to eat their food. Yeah. And, you know, you're touching on a very good point about food and culture. Uh, it, that is the one thing that is similar everywhere it is the food and that's one place that we can gather and almost in peace right is at a dinner table that break that bread mm -hmm. the bread break it dip it in that olive oil and just whatever bread variety you have i created a bread fest after 9 11 in 2005 because i wanted to bring all the faith communities together and i called it the cordoba bread fest and i said let's look at all of our scriptures and let's see what scriptures say about food. So we listed all the foods that were mentioned in all of our three scriptures, you know, the pomegranate, the dates, the olives. And then mm -hmm. we gave all of this to a restaurant and we said, make the food only from these foods. And then we had a fest and we called it the bread fest. And we had a theatrical production around bread. And really? we talked about, you know, the, um, the challah bread and the Shabbat in a theatrical way. And then the Christians did the, the Eucharist. And then the Muslims talked about, you know, how um, bread is considered life itself. So we never throw bread on the street, for instance. You know, we just don't have that tradition because we think bread is something that is, you know, uh, came to life. So, and this theatrical production, 300 people sitting like in a, you know, um, like in a um, the long supper table, uh, mm. and nobody knew who was who. They were all just mixed together, and it was the most. You know, it was like such an experience that people still talk about it today. And people, you need to do it again. Why don't you do this again? And I'm like, oh, I would love to. <laughs> Somebody just has to fund it because it costs money to do this kind of stuff. <laughs> right. So yeah, I mean, we should have these supper tables. And we should bring all people together. It's like a potluck, but you know, but with 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 a meaning, with a meaning. Yes, I think you're definitely onto something there, and I'm gonna watch for <laughs> watch for you doing that. Um, Dr. Daisy Khan, is, is there anything that you would like to leave with 
um, to put in people's minds it, it, as far as uh, Muslims go and, you know, women in uh, Muslim women. Yeah. I, I might be stuttering because I don't know. I don't want to put my foot in my mouth and say something incorrect. Um, yeah. No. Well, I think that, um, like I said, there are 750 million Muslim women in the world. And the reality of Muslim women is different. But here in America, Muslim women are excelling. You know, they are in leadership positions, unbelievable leadership positions. Um, they are highly, you know, I think the second largest religious group where women are earning power is much higher than any other religious group, you know, second religious group. So, um, and they're contributing to, uh, in public service. So a lot of women run nonprofits. Uh, they are going literally into politics because they want to be represented and they want to represent their communities. And they're doing it with uh, not, not giving up their religious uh, values. You know, they are staying okay. true to who they are, but yet they're embracing all of America. And so I think that you will see some really remarkable things um, that are developing within the Muslim community. So don't judge a Muslim woman just because she's wearing a headscarf. That's her way of being modest, or that's her way of observing her faith, or that's her way of showing her identity. So don't look at her as, as if she is oppressed or suppressed. She's not. This is her way, her choice, her way of asserting herself. And look at what's, you know, the substance that she offers. And so a Muslim woman ha does have agency. There's nothing in our scripture does that give her agency. And when you see a, a Muslim woman being violated or denied her rights, it's because of the limited beliefs of men who then politicize the issue for their own gain. And this happens in every culture, right? In America, we're seeing Roe versus Wade being overturned because some people believe that it should be overturned and they're using the political power to do it, right? So it does happen, and this also happens to Muslim women, but let's try and you know not judge an entire group by the actions of a few. I think that unity is a tough sell because everything we see is division everywhere. And if we are to excel as a nation, we need to come together again. Because the genius of America is we are very diverse. We are many, but still we are the one, right? Mm -hmm. And so America has never been defined by its race. America has always been defined by its ethos, the belief that we're all American, right? So you can be an immigrant and you can still call yourself American. You don't have to have blue blood <laughs> or white, whiteness to be an America. That just not how America was configured and how America is going to be configured in the future. So let's not fear the other. Let's enjoy each other's company and let's make this nation a great nation, a truly great nation, because it does have all the ingredients for it to be that. But if we get scared and small and we retreat, we're not going to be able to to excel. Can I put you in as a, a third party candidate? Because you just earned my vote. <laughs> Somebody said that to me once. <laughs> They said they didn't know who to vote for. She said, I'm going to write your name in. I said, oh, please send me the ballot so I can tell people somebody. <laughs> you know, for a lot of people like us, the problem is that when you enter politics, the way the media scrutinizes every person, like a lot of really good candidates, just walk away from it because it's become so yeah. nasty, right? Yes. And it's so nasty and you are expected to be lynched when you go into politics. And sometimes good people just don't want to go there, just want to be lynched anymore. And that's why so many people stay away from politics. Otherwise, yeah. we are 330 million people and we have like the same old candidates. It makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, I, I just want to add one thing too for me as far as before we close out is, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, Islam, we're talking about Muslims, Muslim, Mm -hmm. It's not just in Muslim countries, and as you're referring to, here in America as well. So mm -hmm. uh, don't judge a book by its cover, exactly. and don't do as I had done in the past by filling in the blanks just because you, th you hear or see something on the silver screen, 
and you see something similar, don't fill in the blank and say, oh, that's a terrible person or terrible situation or whatever it might be. Right. Um, yeah. Do, yeah, do well, what you need to question. do. Oftentimes, if you just ask the question, say, I noticed something that was unusual. Can you please explain this to me? You know, I've been explaining <laughs> since 9-11. And, yeah. and I think that I think that fundamentally, I've been in front of so many American audiences. I fundamentally believe that Americans are fair-minded people. And fair-minded in the sense that if you give them information, then and they receive that information from an authentic source where, where it's not being colored by anything, then they accept that. And I literally mm -hmm. came to a place where there was a guy, I was in a church and there was a guy sitting in front of me and he said to me, he said, I've come here to ask you some really tough questions. And he had a list, long laundry list of questions. And then he said to me, well, what about Sharia? And, and I explained what Sharia law was that, you know, it has, it protects six major objectives, uh, you know, life, family, wealth, um, uh, intellect, and dignity, and, and religion, and then, and then I explained, you know, the difference, what, what you see on TV, and then uh, the reality, and I talked about how, um, you know, I said, you know, in America, we have uh, in some places, we have capital punishment. In other places, we absolutely abhor that. I said, similarly, in some Muslim countries, um, people get beheaded. And in majority of countries, nobody does anything. They just, you know, they just get locked up in jail. So so you heard about that beheading, so you think everybody's be, being beheaded. <laughs> right. and so I said, it's the same thing in America, you know? People get outraged by, oh, I don't want capital punishment. So I said, just think of the world as different states of America, right? Where we have different rules and different laws and, you know, and so, um, so then he smiled and he, and he got up at the end and he goes, you nearly convinced me. You nearly convinced me 99% there, <laughs> but you know, this is the person that I needed to stay engaged with. Right? So I don't know what he's going to hear tomorrow, right? That might set him back. Right. Yes, exactly. So so then this level of engagement has to stay on. We have to yeah. stay on with one another if we are sincere about wanting to know the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. But if we are happy with staying in our silo and not wanting to know another truth <laughs> that's out there, then then we remain in ignorance and ignorance is 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 a danger for everyone. And this is why I'm very glad that we are here today having this conversation. Uh, not only to let me know more information, but to let people who don't have the opportunity to listen to somebody like you, if it wasn't for, you know, programs that you do or that you partake in, the, the work that you do and, you know, exactly what we're doing right now. Yeah, uh, great. So I say thank you. Thank you very well, much for, for doing this. I'm glad to be here with you and to engage your audience and and so excited that, this random American reached out to me and <laughs> just bringing me on the show. <laughs> you know what I want to do? And I'm going to put this right now, put it out there, is I want to have a conversation with you after the new year. To okay. See what has happened? Oh my God. <laughs> right? So we're talking right into 2025. If you don't reach out to me, Dr. Khan, I'm going to. I'm going to find you. <laughs> Please do, because we have no idea what mayhem is going to be happening at that time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you very much for this. This has really been insightful, and I've enjoyed just uh, listening to you and having our conversation. Yeah, and I've enjoyed interacting with you and sharing whatever I have to offer with your audience. Really yeah. excited to be here. Thank you. And last thing I'm going to say once again, um, 30 Rights of Muslim Women. Yep. Right. By Dr. Daisy Khan. Mm -hmm. 30 Rights of Muslim Women, Dr. Daisy Khan. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.